Hi, Rockets. It's Mrs. Wilgenbush. We are continuing our book club today on Masterminds um, by Gordon Corman. We are chapter 21. Author of this chapter today is Melek Bruder. Let's see what Melek has to say. My mother is the only ballet teacher in Happy Valley, and she only has one student, Laska. Since there aren't any other dancers around, Amber can never be in a real ballet. So every now and then, Mom holds a recital. I look forward to these recitals with the kind of dread most kids reserve for having their teeth drilled when the dentist from Taos comes to town. About 20 people pack into my living room and see her do pirouettes and grand gelettes and a bunch of other stuff with French names. It's about as happening as watching a in a tutu, which never works, since Laska hasn't got the brains to be embarrassed by being in a tutu. Naturally, my mother thinks Amber is the cat's pajamas. She's such a lovely girl, she always says. Trust me, the night my toe got so swollen that the nail came off, Dad made me soak my foot in salt water for an hour and a half. I wasn't thinking such a lovely girl. But the main reason it drives me nuts that Mom is Alaska's number one fan is that the lovely girl is about a polar opposite of me in this place. She takes ballet and piano and volunteers for everything under the sun. For me, it's the point of personal pride to work as little as humanly possible. And even then, I try to con Hector into doing most of it for me. She gets great grades and is a model student, while I'll just barely squeak by. The biggest difference between Amber and me is that she's Serenity's biggest fan, a whole cheerleading squad by herself. Until now. On the long day after the very long night, she makes the quickest U-turn in town history. When she reads the webpage on the Project or Sirius, she looks like she's about to eat Eli's pad in sheer rage. Quiet, Tori advises nervously. We don't want the purples on our necks. So Amber calmly clamps her hands on the factory fence and squeezes until blood from her fingers begins to trickle down the chain links. Some girls can't handle learning their, their clones, I guess. And the other stuff, like your parents being strangers and your entire life being a lie, it takes all four of us to pull her off the fence. When we let her go, she sinks into the cross like a position on the grass. I want to. Instead of finishing the sentence, she lashes out at a sneakered foot and crushes a grasshopper, twisting it into the ground. And I'm the toxic element? I wonder if anybody ever thought about weeding out Laska. How about we just bounce instead, I suggest. Our parents, she sees, they're not going to get, let, get away with this. The amazing part is that her cheerleading doesn't stop. What's new is that instead of being for the town, now she's against it. Suddenly, she hates Happy Valley as much as she loved it before. It almost doesn't matter how she feels, just how much. Hey, I'm not complaining. I'm with her 100%. This might be the first thing we've agreed on in 13 years. Seriously, though, I do sympathize with her. The stuff that we've been gradually learning about ourselves over the weeks is hitting her all at once. Talk about a shock to the system, especially since a good chunk of it makes about as much sense as a Rotham WGN. In a matter of hours, her entire world has been turned upside down, and most of the details are still a mystery. I know you're angry, Eli pleads. We're just as upset at when we found out, but you have to act normal. If you start accusing your parents, you'll be giving up the one advantage we have. They don't know that we know. She's quiet again, but still stubborn. I don't care. The point is, I insist, here in town, our folks call the shots. Our only chance of having real lives is by busting out. That's what we worked hard toward. There's no other way to fight this. The toxic element trying to reason with the ball of fury. She clenches her jaw. How about we heave a brick through every window in town? Think they'll get the message then? We stare at her in shock. It's so obvious you're upset and you lash out and break something. I wonder who she's cloned from. Whoever it must be someone who has a bad side you want to stay away from. It's easy to fix windows, Hector notes. Last because know. How about a whole factory? Come to think of it, I'm starting to like her style. Eli shakes his, shakes his head. It doesn't make sense. It would just tip our hand that we're onto them. Then we'd have to fi five of us be on happy pills, not just me. Who knows how long it would take us to figure out this all out again, assuming we ever do. Even Amber has to accept that. She's starting to calm down. 
I could almost feel her fury morphing into grim determination. Fine, we escape, she agrees, but we come back later to get justice for everything that's been done to us. If I get out of here, says Hector earnestly, I'm never coming back, not even to wreck the place. Aren't we getting a little ahead of ourselves, I ask? We're not going anywhere until we can figure out a way through that invisible fence. Excuse me for taking a little more personally than the rest of you guys. You know, with Serena Day coming and probably Weeding Day right after that, that shuts everybody up in a hurry. Nothing can pan attention like being the first on the chopping block. We can't be exactly sure what the project or series has in mind for me, but it's hard to imagine it being anything good. Well, Troy muses, what is it about us that gets so sick when we come against the barrier? Randy didn't. Our parents don't. And the workmen from outside have to pass through there like they come and go. Why aren't they affected? Regular people aren't made in a lab, Eli explains darkly. When we are born, the scientists must have put something inside of us, some kind of an antenna or a receiver that reacts to a signal on the barrier. If they don't have a chip or whatever it is, you don't even know the obstacle is there. But if you do, well, just think back to last night. Like an invisible dog fence for clones, I put in. How can you joke about this, Amber challenges. There's something inside of us like a spider crawling around our heads and we can't reach it and get it out. It's not alive, Tori sues. It might as well be. It's controlling us, putting a giant wall between us and everything else. We're getting too emotional about this, warns Eli. We have to think like scientists. Those are the people who set this all up. The barrier must be some kind of wireless signal. And a wireless signal can be turned off, I finish his thought. So the trick is to figure out what's generating it. That becomes job number one. Identifying the source of the berry that's keeping us in Happy Valley. I'm actually kind of optimistic. When the whole town the size is the size of an average cow pie, there isn't much ground to cover, especially when you consider we're looking for something like an antenna or a transmitter, probably high up. Serenity isn't much higher than a cow pie either. The highest points in town are the antenna on the roof of the plastic works, the clock tower in front of the town hall, the aerial on top of the flagpole in the park, Using his iPad, Eli takes a picture of all three, and we start checking our photos against similar images online. Turns out that the one in the factory, which I was betting on, is purely a receiver. They must be where the real internet comes from. The web we're allowed to have, plus our TV and radio, all come from a Serenity cable. The flagpole seems to be a classic cellular phone transmitter receiver with very limited range, probably the town only. The clock tower is the biggest bust of all. There's nothing up there but a clock. Amber has a brainstorm. Do you think it could be the Serenity Cup or maybe the case or the pedestal it stands on? I think she might be onto something. Seriously, what other purpose could that hunk of junk serve? It certainly didn't come from Roosevelt, who was dead a half a century before Felix Hammerstrom and that billionaire lady got that bright idea to invent Happy Valley. So the next stop is the park to investigate the Serenity Cup. This is not as easy as it sounds, since Rump All Stiltskin and some other purple is sitting in the factory staring at a bunch of video screens, which have, one of which is a live feed from the camera trained right on this wonderful trophy of ours. Tori comes up with an idea to play monkey in the middle, so we can all fall over it for a closer look. The purples may not get a very high opinion of our frisbee skills, but with any kind of luck, they won't notice that we're searching for hidden antenna or electric wiring or listening for a power sound. But here's the thing. Turns out the serenity cup is about as electric as a loaf of bread. No vibration, no heat, no hum. It's the deadest thing in town, which is saying something when you're talking about Happy Valley. I channel my disappointment into a vicious tackle on Hector, driving him into the grass with my full weight. I can tell he's really worried about me because he swallows any word of complaint as he lies there, gasping to gain his breath. I can't believe it's come to this. I'm being pitied by Hector Amani. He's limping as we struggle, struggle out of the park. So it's just a trophy? I've got a theory about that, Eli muses. I think it's a kind of an early warning system. The whole purpose of Osiris is to see if we go bad because we've been cloned by terrible people. So if they leave the big silver cup totally unprotected to see which one of us is going to be the first to steal it. Like I want it, I say sarcastically. Hector brings us back to Earth. 
So what do we do? We've eliminated a bunch of things that aren't the transmitter, but we still don't know, still don't know what is. We hear a familiar roar. A cone truck drives by on the Harmony Street. It's not the one with Hector's blood. I've learned to pick out the crusty brown stains from the hallway across town. And then I see it. I'm pretty sure it's always been there, but there's so much to question about the cargo that we never bothered to look inside the truck itself. There is a small rotating satellite dish about two feet in diameter on the roof of the cab. I pinch Eli. Ow! Do the other trucks have those? He rubs his arm, scowling. I don't think so. The one I bled on definitely does it, puts in Hector. Amber speaks up. I always figured it was like GPS or something. Why would they need a GPS on a truck that rides around in circles and never leaves town, asks Eli. I grin. You wouldn't unless your GPS isn't a GPS. And that's it for today. Hope you're well, Rockets, and I'll be back with you soon.